Hello and welcome to CBC New Brunswick's Leaders Forum. This is New Brunswick Votes 2020 Leaders on the Record. We are coming to you from Teot Lescawet in Moncton and we are pleased to welcome you to this special pre-election broadcast. And if you're joining us on CBC Radio 1, welcome. I'm Jonna Brewer. We are here with the leaders of the five political parties. They'll be vying for your vote in this campaign. But first, let's meet our panelists. Joining us on stage, CBC journalist Rachel Cave and Jacques Poitra. Good evening. Good Hello. evening, Jonna. Hello. Good evening, Jacques. Hello. We've got some great uh, audience questions and our own as well. Yes, and we are really looking forward to hearing the answers from the leaders. Well, it's great to have you both here. And of course, we'll be hearing about the leaders' plans for running the province over the next four years. So let's introduce them. First, Mackenzie Thomason, leader of the NDP. Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance. Blaine Higgs, leader of the Progressive Conservatives. Kevin Vickers, leader of the Liberal Party. David Kuhn, leader of the Green Party. So thank you for joining us today. And here's what's going to happen over the next 90 minutes. Our far, five leaders have drawn lots to see who will stand where and who will go first. There are four main themes with two questions each, one from our audience and one from our panelists. Each leader will have 90 seconds to respond to each of those questions. There will be no open debate. After each leader has responded to both questions, our panelists will pose a follow-up question to one or more leaders based on their responses. They will have a maximum of 60 seconds each to respond. After all four themes have been discussed, the leaders will have just 60 seconds each for their closing statements. And if it looks like we will exceed our allotted 90-minute broadcast in order to be able to give each leader their closing statements, your responses to the final question will be shortened from 90 seconds to 60 seconds. And just a reminder, there will be no debate. We ask that you respectfully refrain from cross-talk and let every leader be given their opportunity to speak. So we begin with our first theme, health and social policy. My name is Cheyenne Joseph, and I'm the Executive Director of the Rising Sun Treatment Centre in Natawaganeg, Eel Ground First Nation. Over the past 20 years, I've heard many accounts of community members' problematic experiences in New Brunswick's justice and healthcare systems. My question for the leaders is, what will your party do to address racism in the justice and healthcare systems in New Brunswick? So you each have 90 seconds to respond. Kevin Vickers from the Liberal Party, you have the first response. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, CVC and all the viewers at home. I want to thank you very much for joining us this evening. And how wonderful to get a, a question from Cheyenne, my home river on the Miramichi. Um, it's fantastic. So thanks for that. Here we are, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before you tonight, an election that nobody wanted nor needed. Uh, this is an election purely for one person, Blaine Higgs, and his power grab to execute his secret agenda. Now, Cheyenne, I really believe that systemic discrimination and systemic racism exist in all sectors of our society. I lived in First Nations communities, Cheyenne, all my life. Uh, Ten years up in the Northwest Territories, here at home, uh, I've had many, many opportunities to interact with our First Nations community. And as a police officer for 29 years, I realized that systemic discrimination is something that it really does exist and systemic racism goes. But it's these societal outcomes that we really have to focus on and to change. And one way we're going to do that, Cheyenne, is I was met Chief Bill Ward up in your community just last week and promised that we would uh, invoke a public inquiry into the issues that you're talking about. And you're right, it exists in all sectors of our society, Cheyenne. Not just uh, the policing and justice system, but in health and everything we do. So we are really going to be working with you, working with the communities, bringing people together and uh, bringing going forward. Thank Thanks. you, Mr. Vickers. Chris Austin, question goes to you. 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for taking the time to tune in and watch this leaders' debate. I know how politics goes, and I understand that oftentimes you have busy lives, you, you have uh, uh, jobs to go to, kids going back to school, and all that it entails. So I'm just very pleased that you've taken the opportunity tonight to, uh, to watch this, to hear from all of us on our opinions and our vision going forward. In terms of the issue of racism in New Brunswick, you know, I do believe that New Brunswick as a whole is a great place to live, and I believe it is an inclusive province that accepts all people. I do not believe that anybody at any time should be judged simply by the color of their skin, their ethnicity, or what language they speak. We should be included equally as New Brunswickers. As a result, I am committed to doing whatever I can in terms of legislation, policy, or whatnot to ensure that racism is not uh, a strong point in New Brunswick, but rather that it's mitigated and, and that we can put an end to it. I do believe that there are, uh, you know, training maybe that has to happen within uh, certain police forces to ensure that, uh, you know, the justice is carried out adequately and equally, and that, again, nobody is ever judged based on the color of their skin or their ethnicity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Blaine Higgs. Thank you for the question, Cheyenne, and I agree. Systemic racism exists throughout our province and throughout our country, and it is time for action. Over the past 25 years, there have been roughly 797 recommendations made to make improvements, and about 20%, only about 20% of those recommendations have been ever fulfilled. My goal was to actually get action. In Nova Scotia, they made changes to their justice system that was developed from the McAvoy Report a few years ago. Uh, back in 93. We have roadmaps to follow where we can make movement now. We can get things done now. And we have many recommendations to fulfill. So it was kind of a two-pronged action for me. One was, let's get on with what's already been recommended, what's working elsewhere, and, and make something happen. Secondly, let's look at a public inquiry and what that would entail differently than what we've already learned from others. Let's not spend the next three, four, five years talking about it. Cheyenne, we need action. We need to recognize the challenges that, that you face, others face, and they are real. But we need to get something accomplished. Let's engage the rest of the country in a, in a public inquiry. So it, it, is, it is known that we have an issue in Canada. Other provinces need to be engaged. Our federal government needs to be engaged. We have a roadmap to follow, and we can start on a two-prong path. One for action today from recommendations already made, and another for how do we get better in the future from recommendations that need to come forward and we react on. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. Uh, David Kuhn. Well, do any of us up here on this panel look like we possibly could understand the depth and breadth of systemic racism in our justice and police systems in New Brunswick? Absolutely not. We need to hear the lived experience of people from across New Brunswick, Indigenous people in New Brunswick, about how they've encountered the justice and police uh, systems, what their experience has been, so we can have a, a sense of what kind of changes need to be made to fix the system to get systemic racism out of those systems. And that's why we will launch uh, an inquiry with Indigenous uh, leadership in the inquiry to enable all of us to appreciate the kind of uh, oppression that exists in the system. It's not about how people feel about others. It's a systemic problem. And none of us have the ability uh, to understand what's been going on, what kind of experience others have felt. So that's why now, an inquiry into systemic racism in New Brunswick, into New Brunswick's justice system, into New Brunswick's policing system is absolutely essential. We've just gone through the terrible, terrible killings of Chantal Moore at Ronnie Levi. And where is the justice in that? We have heard nothing since those happened. So we would launch an inquiry as soon as we possibly could on forming government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Mackenzie Thomason, and your response. Thank you everybody for having us stay and thank you everyone who's watching uh, for tuning in with us this evening. This is an excellent question. It is very often talked about about our issues with systemic racism in the justice system. But I have not received a question yet that has talked about racism and systemic racism in other aspects of our public sector. Training and accountability need to be at the forefront of every decision that is made in regards to systemic racism in our services going forward. 
We need to make sure that the people who are offering these services are able to recognize inherent biases in the system. And more importantly, we need to make sure that when issues are arising, that the people who are responsible for those issues are held accountable for their actions. We, again, thank you for this question. It was great. Um, and it's, we really need to focus on the fact that as a government, as a minority government, hopefully, we will be able to get together to make sure that we are not only holding a public inquiry, that we're making sure that that happens, but that we're following up. We can't have a public inquiry if we're not willing to implement what is in that public inquiry. It's just a waste of money if we don't. It's a waste of time, and all it is is dangling a carrot in front of the people who this is affecting. So we do need a public inquiry, and more importantly, we need to implement those changes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomason. All right, let's go to our panelists. The CBC's Rachel Cave has a question on the same topic. First response goes to Chris Austin of the People's Alliance. Thank you, Jonna. Many New Brunswickers don't have access to family doctors or mental health care. Last February's attempt by the health authorities to reallocate resources by reducing ER hours at six hospitals was quashed after a backlash. What is one concrete, actionable change that you would make to increase access to health care anywhere in the system, Mr. Austin? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Rachel, and uh, it's important to note that the ER closures was quashed because of a minority situation. Had we been in the middle of a majority situation, those folks in those rural areas would have unquestionably lost their hospital. So I think it's important not to forget rural New Brunswick, but to ensure that health care is available to every New Brunswicker, whether you live in rural or urban areas. One thing that we have pushed very hard for is more doctor recruitment. Uh, we did push in the last election for the elimination of billing numbers in the uh, uh, enhancement of recruiting doctors so that they can come to this province and practice uh, where they choose. Now what's important as well is when we talk about health care, it has to be a multi-pronged approach. You have to have good ambulance service when needed. And we have done a lot to enhance faster response times, especially in rural areas with the changes to the, to the uh, re requirements for paramedics in terms of language. We're very proud of that. We've also pushed very hard on ensuring that virtual care is available, which has high approval. And, and really when you think about it, for common ailments, it's much easier uh, to go to uh, your doctor through a computer or an iPad to get a prescription refill or to get a simple ailment looked at. So those are all things I think can play a part, but at the end of the day, it really boils down to recruiting doctors. We need doctors and specialists in New Brunswick, and Liberal and Conservative governments have failed over the years to do that uh, appropriately, and we will continue to push for that recruitment effort. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Austin. Blaine Higgs. COVID has taught us that we need to be innovative. It's always easy to say hire more doctors, and I think the Medical Society mentioned we should hire 300 more. Well, in fact, we hired 94 doctor, more doctors this past 15 months, but the rest of the story would be we've lost 104, either through retirement or moving or a number of reasons. So the reality is times are changing, but every province is looking for doctors and medical professionals. Every province, medical professionals are in short supply. So what do we need to do to improve primary care? We need to look at areas of, of virtual care, which we've gone from zero to 85 percent in the, in the last, through the COVID crisis. So now people have that first, first defense, that first actionable item that can get closer to uh, primary care service. We need more nurse practitioners, and we're already set that up in three areas to reduce the load on primary care and the doctor's load, because we're just not going to be able to get more doctors. They said the third option is through pharmacists. We need pharmacists to have a more widespread capability to deal with the routine items, and therefore reducing load on, uh, on doctors in our system. We must be innovative. We've learned through COVID just how good we can be. And this is no time to think in the ways of the past. This is a time to think for the future. And thinking for the future means finding new ways to deliver health care. It means dealing with mental services quickly, promptly, as we put out in this platform, because that first line of defense quickly can make the difference in someone's life. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. David Kuhn. Thank you for the question. I want to talk about mental health and addictions. One of the things we would do right away is to turn our mental health mobile uh, crisis response teams into first responders. So they're available 24-7, just like firefighters, just like police, just like paramedics absolutely essential so when there is a call they can respond 
with the expertise and the experience that's necessary to handle mental health and addictions. And this, we have those teams in place in every region of the province, and that means we've got to ensure that there's local or local autonomy and authority in health care to ensure that people's local health care needs are met properly uh, and when they need to be met. I was talking to a paramedic just last night who said every time he goes off shift, he calls his local mental health mobile response team to let them know to let them know what had happened and what's likely to happen based on the calls he had had up until he went off shift at five o'clock. So that's the number one thing. We've got, to, we've got a crisis here, both in mental health and addictions, and we've got to respond. We've, we've got to decentralize because right now the centralization is causing problems. In, uh, in Fredericton, there's the Riverstone Recovery Center to help people with addictions, which Medicare is saying they're not going to support because it doesn't align with their priorities. This is an innovative effort led by a local young pharmacist and Dr. Sarah Davidson from our community health center. Why aren't we doing what's necessary on the ground? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, Mackenzie Thomason. This issue has exemplified that minority governments work. If it was not for a minority government, six rural hospitals would have lost their overnight health care services. Emergencies do not just happen between 8 and 5 in the daytime. They happen at 24-7 intervals. It is very important that when we talk about health care, mental health care, and access in general, that we are talking about getting the 30,000 New Brunswickers who are on a waiting list off of that waiting list. Part of that is by encouraging family doctors to practice in this province. This government has shown that it does not want family doctors practicing in this province. It has plans, to, it's not funding Clinic 554, and that primarily is a family health resource. He is a family doctor. So by throwing those 3,000 New Brunswickers back onto that waiting list does not show any commitment to health care progress in this province. Mental health care and Medicare expansion in general all need to be included when government sits down to talk about health care. We need dental care. We need pharma care. We need eye care. If I take these off, I can't drive. That is going to prevent me from participating economically. It's going to prevent me from going to work. When you talk about health care, you need to talk about expansion. You need to talk about universality. And you need to make sure that it is affordable and included in the Medicare system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomason and Kevin Vickers. Ladies and gentlemen, I can think of no more important topic than access to health care. Two years ago, when Mr. Higgs stood before you, he looked you in the eye and he promised there would be no cuts to service in health. Just last spring, he tried to cut services in seven of your local hospitals, places like Sussex and Sackville, Karaket, just to name a few, a couple of them. Your health care is dependent on your local health facility staying open, being able to serve there, serve you, your grandparents, your parents, uh, your, uh, our elderly people, and our children. And if Mr. Higgs is given a mandate he is going to cut more services. And we also know that he has a phase two. He has a secret agenda when it comes to cutting health services. Access to health care is vitally important. Answer specifically the question, I'm really going to work at desensitizing and doubling down our efforts and coming up with a concrete HR plan to attract nurses and doctors to our uh, beautiful, beautiful province. And that's one of the reasons why we can attract them here. We do have a beautiful province and we have great New Brunswick people. We have a great public service in healthcare and all, er all areas. So we really have to double down on our efforts to ensure that we're attracting the best. And I know that we can. You know, just last spring we had nurse practitioners graduate and leave our province due to incentives. So that's where I'm going to be and that's what I'm going to do. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. Jacques and Rachel, you have up to three minutes to pose a follow-up question to one or more leaders. And leaders, you will have a maximum of 60 seconds to respond. Uh, Mr. Thomason, you mentioned Clinic 554. Even if abortions were funded at that clinic by Medicare, there would still be large parts of the province that would not have access to, a, to the service nearby. What is the right level of access to abortion service in the province? That's an excellent question. It's something that I am very happy to answer. Clinic 554 needs to be a model. It needs to not only be funded, but be implemented as a model around the province. When we talk about access to reproductive care, to LGBTQ plus health care, you cannot call it accessible if you have to get on a bus 
from Fredericton to go to Moncton. You cannot call it accessible if you have to take a whole day off work or possibly two just to make it to your appointment. That is not access to health care. Well, yes, technically it is provided at three hospitals in this province. For the majority of New Brunswickers, it's too far. It's too costly to get there just to put gas in your car or to buy a bus ticket. The proper level of care is having one uh, clinic where you don't have to drive, I would say, any more than a couple of hours to get to your appointment, to get to the service that you are requiring so that you can still participate at your job, so you can still live your life while going to access your health care. Thank you, Mr. Thomason. Uh, Mr. Higgs, would you care to respond? I, uh, like um, most of my colleagues here, are, um, would not be a medical professional. Um, we have, um, we have a, a health authority. We have medical profession professionals that would define what access uh, means and what it should be. We have public institutions across our province uh, to provide that access. So I have said, and I've said it a number of times, that if we do not or are not providing the proper access in our public uh, hospitals, then I would expect a recommendation from the health authorities, from the medical professionals, that actually um, can interpret what's required and what access should really mean. Uh, we believe in this province that uh, we're following the same rules that were put in place several years ago, um, and we believe we're meeting the Canada Health Act requirements. And so, as I say, I would ask for the professionals to advise if further solutions in our public institutions would be required. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. Chris Austin, would you like to respond? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I, I believe strongly in a public health system. And uh, I believe that that public health system needs to be properly funded. You know, we have people with uh, knee and hip replacements that are waiting up to two years or longer for those procedures. I can tell you that I personally uh, underwent uh, heart surgery here several years ago. And although I'm from the Grand Lake area, it wasn't a procedure I was able to get done in Fredericton or anywhere close to Fredericton. I had to go to St. John. And sometimes in a province's size, we have to be you know, reasonable about the fact that it's going to take a little bit of a drive to get special uh, treatment from a specialist or certain areas that need to be done in health care. And uh, again, that's why I believe in a strong publicly funded health care system, uh, one that can deliver the proper services to, uh, to its citizens. Thank you, Mr. Austin. <music> Moving on to our next theme, Education. Hi, my name's Tondaway McCarthy, and even before our current crisis, some provinces such as Alberta have been financially supporting families that have chosen to homeschool their families. These funds have gone to things such as textbooks, 50% of internet fees, and even reimbursing home art and music lessons. So my question is, is the New Brunswick government willing to do more to support families that choose to homeschool this pandemic? All right, this question goes first to the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, Blaine Higgs, and you have 90 seconds. Thank you uh, for the question. I think we need to look at in terms of our, uh, what we're actually achieving in our public school system. And, and in fact, if there are shortcomings there, what that, what that needs to change in order to improve that. We're all paying tax dollars in order to have the best system possible. And while I certainly appreciate the, the dedication that goes into homeschooling and what that requires, there, ha there can be a balance on both sides of how that is uh, supported or funded um, or what, what items would be looked at as a possibility. Uh, I think that we've seen through, um, through this COVID experience, it's changed the views on education and how it's done differently. I think many of our education services in the future will be done online, which would mean they could be done anywhere. Uh, certainly if we have a second wave, that's exactly what'll happen. I'm very proud of the setup that we've had uh, moving back to school. It's been recognized across the country as uh, what we're doing. We're moving on a 10-year program that was developed several years ago to enhance that. Uh, if that enhancement includes more flexibility for homeschooling, um, you know, I'd be willing to look at that. But again, the educators need to provide a, a uh, view into what the difference is and why it's, it would be required. We, we cannot invent policy on the fly or on the campaign trail. I, I believe our province will get better when sustainability becomes a factor, when decisions with facts become a factor, and when decisions uh, that are made become a reality once all those factors are, are considered. And for me, I would want to know from the educators the value on both, both ends, side sides, and go from there. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. Uh, David Kuhn, your response. Thank you, Jana. 
Uh, there's always been families who have been interested in homeschooling, but in New Brunswick there's been little in the way of resources to support them, and, and there should be. And I would support that. Uh, I know families who uh, have been really motivated to homeschool their children, have gone out of the way, worked really hard, been tenacious to, to dig out the resources and dig out the, the, uh, the materials they need to be effective uh, homeschool teachers, in a sense. Uh, but we also need to regulate homeschooling so that it actually is an effective form of education in the province. It's not well, regu uh, well uh, uh, regulated at all. I met a young man not that long ago who was in his 20s who uh, explained to me that he had been homeschooled, uh, which meant, uh, in fact, in his case, his parents were not highly motivated uh, in actually doing the homeschooling, and uh, he, he didn't get much of an education whatsoever, and he was struggling to put together his own education uh, as a young uh, man in his early 20s. So the regulation of homeschooling has to go hand in hand with uh, ensuring that the appropriate resources and uh, materials are available for parents who choose that route uh, to educate their children. I've seen it work very effectively. I know families who have homeschooled whose children have, uh, have uh, incredible careers. Uh, but as I said, I've met others where the homeschooling really was just in name only, uh, and that's a, a shortfalling on the part of our education system to let that happen uh, without uh, some kind of monitoring and, and regulatory process. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, Mackenzie Thomason, over to you. Education is the most important aspect of any economy. It is the most important aspect of any province. And for those who do choose to homeschool, especially during a pandemic, the resources need to be there for the parent or for the homeschool professional to perform the educational requirements at an adequate level. When we talk about going back to school, it's something the majority of the province did uh, just yesterday. And when we talk about making resources available for parents, for students, um, we really need to talk about adequate funding. Whether you're going back to school, whether you're continuing to do homeschooling, or whether you're doing remote learning, um, you need to make sure that as a government, as an MLA, and as a representative, that the resources are there for people to take advantage of and to use. Um, the $600 credit for a laptop uh, was put in place for students particularly going back to school or who were doing remote learning. Unfortunately, it, you're going to be hard pressed to find a laptop for $600. So when we're talking about access to education during a pandemic, we really have to focus on the fact that the funding needs to be there. Uh, being a government that would, would waste money on corporate welfare but not choose to give money to uh, students, to parents, to educate themselves and to educate their children is wrong. Education needs to be the building block of a further generation to help move New Brunswick forward. Thank you, Mr. Thomason. Kevin Vickers. I love this question and thinking outside the box and coming up with new initiatives, uh, bringing New Brunswick education to the 21st century is great. My daughter, who I love very much, is a homeschool teacher. She teaches my two grandsons, Luke and Lachlan, and the success that they're having and enjoying their mother at home, being outside. They do a lot of, quote, forest school. A lot of their outdoor activities are connected to are connected to their education plan that Laura has for them. And, you know, I really, really think this is something, and we have a, a candidate down in St. John, Tim Jones, who runs a large forest school, outside school for, for kids, and he just can't keep up with the applications that are coming in for his uh, school down in, down in St. John. So I really think this is an exciting time. I think it, I'd be open, and not I think I will be totally open as Premier to coming up with these u unique ideas, thinking outside the box, and bringing New Brunswickers together. But there's nothing more important than a mother and her children. Mothers are the cornerstone of our society and the dads as well. But I mean, you know, to homeschool your children is a privilege. I really think it's something that uh, it's exciting. I witnessed it, I observed it, I know that it works. And uh, I would really encourage everyone to be uh, think, thinking about this. And I believe there may be economies there. You know, schools and classrooms are expensive to run. So we even may find savings in this very productive way of teaching our, our children. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. Chris Austin. Thank you for the question, and education is without, 
you know, any doubt, one of the most important aspects of government service that will be provided not only to this generation, but more importantly to the next one uh, to come. And I guess I want to start by all the teachers that are watching this tonight. I want to say how much I, I appreciate the work that you do. I know the struggle that you face, whether it's overcrowded classrooms, an inclusion program that doesn't have the resources to back up the demand. Uh, and I, I talk to many of you that say, uh, you know, you, you have to take out of your own pocket just to look after the students because you can't bear to see students go without in your own classrooms. I can tell you I admire uh, the work and dedication that you do and the long hours that you put in uh, marking tests and everything at, at night. In, in the work that it entails. Uh, I do believe that in education as a whole in the public system, we need to branch out into more trades. Uh, I know in my community of Minto, I fought very hard uh, to just keep one of the trades in, in, in the high school that my son attends. And I know rural areas all over struggle with uh, allowing enough trades for hands-on work so that the uh, kids can come out of there, students can graduate and, and uh, take a different route if they so choose directly to the question of homeschooling. I think homeschooling is a great idea for many people and it can work for many people. Some of the best and brightest start at homeschool. And if government can do uh, different programs or incentives, tax incentives uh, or different ideas to help foster that homeschool environment, I'd certainly be on board with that. I think it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Now continuing with the theme of education, a question from the CBC's Jacques Poitras. The PC government proposed ideas such as grouping students by their learning requirements rather than their age and rethinking how we teach French. That discussion was put on hold because of the pandemic. Should those ideas be revived and if so, when? Thank you, Jacques. Let's begin with David Kuhn of the Green Party. Well, some students are already grouped uh, in multiple uh, grade classrooms, so that's something that's uh, worked very well in the schools that that's been implemented in. It's not something you can do at the drop of a hat. You have to plan for it uh, and uh, organize it properly and have the right teachers to teach those uh, blended classrooms. Um, so uh, where it's appropriate, where it can work, where the resources are there, uh, yeah, we should, we should look at that. Um, as far as uh, revisiting French language training in our schools, we should be improving it uh, all the time and we haven't been that's the problem how do we make sure that our immersion programs are as effective as they possibly can be how do we ensure that the core french program is actually uh ensuring that when children uh, and students graduate uh, that they're able to carry on a conversation in french if all they've had is core french that's not the case so of course we need to be uh, looking at these things but not we the politicians uh, we have no expertise in education. It's the educators uh, who should be uh, working on those things. We've got amazing educators in our school system. We've got amazing, amazing uh, education experts in our university systems, um, both uh, Anglophone and Francophone, and let's put them to work uh, to uh, make the best recommendations to meet the needs of our children, our students, across uh, our school systems. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Mackenzie Thomason. So as far as multi-grade uh, or multi-age bundles, I should say, I, I believe it is on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, it has to work with each school, it has to work with each group of kids, it has to work with each different teacher. Um, trying to implement a standardized thing across, uh, a new standardized thing across the entire province with so many different dynamics working is something that would take time, that would not be able to be implemented anytime soon, and it does need a lot of work. It does need a lot of research put into it. As far as the French immersion training, I am one of those people who, uh, you know, I was registered to go to French immersion. Unfortunately, in Alberta, they don't offer that. And um, when I moved out there, it was something that was lost uh, to me. But when we're talking about French immersion training, the more people we have in this province that are able to communicate at a somewhat of a basic level in both official languages, I think the better we're going to be, the closer we're going to be able to be as a province. When we are talking about education in general, we need to make sure, again, that the funding is there. This is something that the NDP gets criticized for a lot, is that we want to just spend, spend, spend. That's not the case. What we're trying to do is we're trying to bring funding levels back to where they need to be after what is now decades and decades of conservative and liberal cuts to our education system. So when we talk about uh, new ideas, we need to talk about funding first to make sure that we can adequately teach our next generation of students. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Thomas. And Kevin Vickers, over to you. Well, first and foremost, I want to take a moment to salute our school principals and our teachers and educators for 
an incredible job they've done in preparing to our schools for opening and to have our children there in their safe hands. Um, it's just been an incredible, incredible work. And Mr. Kuhn has mentioned, you know, we're not experts in education, and I certainly am not an expert in education. And but sometimes I get a little leery of listening to experts. So one of the first things I'm going to do on policy questions such as this is I'm going to form a committee of teachers, and I'm going to bring teachers from across the province together, frontline teachers who I want to hear from at least twice a year to see how things are going so that we can ensure that we're on, on top. French immersion program here in New Brunswick, you know, you often hear different things about it. My granddaughter, Reese, uh, she's just in French immersion now for three years, and she and I communicate frequently, and she is totally, totally bilingual, both in her oral competency and comprehension. Uh, so I believe in it. I think it's a richness that we have here in New Brunswick to have the ability to speak with one another, to, to enjoy our culture. So whatever we can do to continue on this road and ensure that uh, we have a good uh, French immersion program uh, here, I would certainly, certainly anything. But one of the things that teachers continually tell me they want is they want stability. This previous government and previous minister went on every month for change. Mr. Vickers, we'll have to leave it there. Chris Austin, your response to this question. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, one of the greatest things, uh, or I guess the most important thing that I hear from teachers, I've had several meetings with the MBTA over the years, and what I've heard over and over again is the frustration with the frivolous change that politics has played in the education system. A liberal government gets in, sets out a path, four years later a conservative government gets in, scraps that path and they have to start over again. Can you imagine being a teacher, just finding your groove in a certain path that some politician has declared for you and then another politician of a different color comes in and you have to change it all over again and that happens year after year after year. And at the same time, we don't tackle the big issues like French immersion. The Auditor General herself has made it clear that 10% of all students that enter French immersion in grade one actually meet the language requirement upon graduation. That means 90% of all students that go through French immersion fail at the end of graduation. Now, I don't know of any government program that has a 90% failure rate that we continue uh, to, to ignore. So there's no question, French immersion has to be looked at, and if French immersion doesn't do the job that we need it to do as New Brunswickers, we need to look at alternative methods like they do in other nations and countries to ensure that our kids have a chance at both languages. It is this type of education that really has caused the division over the years in this province and left many people without the ability to communicate in both official languages. So I am committed to do what I can in a minority government to ensure that's tackled. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Thank you. Blaine Higgs. In a meeting a few years ago with the um, president of the MBTA, the first words were in the last 34 years, we've had 35 curriculum changes in the English system. And, and that has been a direct result of politicians inventing policy, inventing curriculum. And I concur that the changes that are continually made have been totally disruptive, not only to our educating staff and their teachers throughout the province, but to students as well. I think every child can reach its full potential, they can reach their full potential, but they need to have the flexibility. And if bundling in different age groups is part of that, then I absolutely agree with that. The 10-year plan, we stayed on the 10-year plan, and the Green Paper uh, exercise was going around listening to teachers and principals all over this province. Because if there's anyone that should justify changing their curriculum, it should be the educators. It should not be here on the campaign trail. We didn't do that. We didn't change the program. We've accessed it through the Green Paper, and COVID may change a lot of these things. But through COVID, we've learned just how many people get engaged in finding solutions, and just what an opportunity we have to make that real. So I am not inventing any solutions on this, on this campaign. I am committing to us actually working with professionals. And in the field of education, in the field of language training, there's lessons to be learned from both Francophone systems and Anglophone systems. Surely we can teach in our province today uh, the rich history we have in both Anglophone and Francophone cultures, both uh, groups to be able to speak both languages, at least in a conversational style when they graduate. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. <clears throat> Over to our panel now, Jacques and Rachel, you have three, up to three minutes to pose a follow-up question to one or more of the leaders. And I'll remind the leaders, you have a maximum of 60 seconds to respond. Okay, thank you, Jonna. Parents are concerned about so many rapid experimental changes in our schools in response to COVID-19. Who should be held accountable for fixing a pandemic learning gap? 
Mr. Thomason. Thank you very much for that question. It's very important that, again, when we're talking about education, we are focusing on funding. We have had decades upon decades of mismanagement of our province's finances, and when they are mismanaged, the first things that are cut are health care and education. So when we talk about a, an education system that is not ready to accept a COVID style issue like it has, we have to look back at funding. As far as responsibility, the government needs to take responsibility for introducing those funds. They need to take responsibility for properly funding the education system. However, it is up to educators, principals, teachers assistants, educational assistants to work with the government and it's up to us as legislators to start that conversation to figure out what is best suited for each school, for each classroom and for each group of students. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Thomason. Mr. Vickers, would you care to respond? Yes, you know, education, like our health care, should be accessible and open and equitable to all segments of our society. The means test that the previous government has uh, put forward for the distribution of laptops among based on different incomes to me is totally unacceptable. We need to have ensuring, always ensuring that our citizens have equal access to education. What I really am concerned on this issue uh, of education is the unfulfilled promises of Mr. Higgs in the last election. He talked about a Teachers' Freedoms Act. It, it, never, it never happened. He talked about other uh, promises that he was going to do. He's going to increase literacy. That never happened. And with regards to his comments about listening to the experts, sir, I believe perhaps uh, Mr. Dominic Carty never got your memo on that one. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. David Kuhn. Thanks, John. I think we don't know yet whether there's going to be a COVID education gap, um, but with such a centralized system now, uh, it's, it's very possible that some areas of the province are going to experience that. So what we would do is, is decentralize the education system in the sense of providing greater autonomy at the more local level and actually go back to the school district uh, boundaries that we had not that long ago so that the, the school uh, superintendents and, and all of those within school districts are much closer to the teachers and the principals that they're responsible for uh, to ensure that decisions that are made uh, apply properly, not one size fits all to the schools that uh, are in their area. I think of high speed internet and the lack of access to high speed internet. For some reasons in this province, for high schoolers who are supposed to be working every other day online, it's not going to be there. And so that could create exactly the gap uh, that uh, we're talking about potentially here. So we need to fix that, um, but it needs to be identified and acted upon soon. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Moving on to our next theme now, the economy. I'm Coral Shui. I'm a business owner in Fredericton. My question to the leaders is, do you think we should expect structural economic changes in New Brunswick? And what's your plan to adapt to this change and help different economic sectors to bounce back? Mackenzie Thomason, first response to you, you have 90 seconds. The economy is the most integral part of making sure that New Brunswickers are able to be fulfilled in their lives, to be fulfilled with their families, and it's the most important aspect that any government should be looking at because it helps influence all other decisions. When we talk about restructuring the economy, which should have been done, I would argue, decades ago, but when we talk about restructuring after COVID, when we talk about COVID recovery, we really need to talk about the fact that there are companies in this province that receive millions upon millions upon millions of dollars worth of tax breaks, worth of sweetheart deals, worth of special permissions from government that the people of New Brunswick do not get to enjoy. When we talk about corporate welfare and we talk about education and we talk about health care, 
with the two main parties, you always get this same idea that structuring the economy from the top down is somehow going to magically start working. That's not how the economy works. I am 23 years old. I can tell you that as my generation leaves this province in droves, it is mainly because of economic disadvantage here at home. Why would I work for 1150 or 1175 an hour now here when I can go to Alberta, do the same job, and make a better living? So when we talk about economic recovery, we need to make sure that we are focusing on corporate welfare recipients so that we can take that money, reinvest it into the people, and allow them to spend their money in the economy, because that is what is going to grow New Brunswick's economy. Thank you, Mr. Thomason. Uh, Kevin Vickers, your response. Yes, when I become Premier, there are going to be some changes in the economy. In fact, I want to transform the economy of our province to bring good jobs, good paying jobs to all New Brunswickers. We're going to do that by having a very specific focus. We're going to be focusing on technology, which already has a great uh, a footprint here in Fredericton. We're going to be able to really ensure that it, uh, it uh, grows and, and uh, we develop that thing. The green economy. There are so many opportunities in the green economy for solar, uh, wind, uh, you know, our, our ocean, our, all kinds of opportunities. We see uh, tidal wave generation now, all types of uh, opportunities there. But most importantly, a once in a generation opportunity for all New Brunswick, and that is small modular nuclear reactors. I am going to be making that a passion of mine to ensure that uh, New Brunswick has this opportunity to develop this new safe energy technology that will fill the gap between renewables where we would want to be as much as possible, but will also fill that gap, creating up to 10,000 direct jobs and 40,000 indirect jobs. But I believe for New Brunswick to go forward, we have to go forward with a plan of growth and investing in our economy, making our economy grow. My friend, Mr. Higgs, his view is cuts and austerity. That's the choice. That's the path. Mine is one of investment and growth. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. Chris Austin. The economy is without question one of the most important parts of, of a province and its function. And New Brunswick, we have to realize, has uh, the, the highest um, age of demographics in, in the country. Atlantic Canada as a whole has an incredibly aging population which means that most of our young people are going somewhere else to work. They're taking their families with them, and it creates a huge deficit on society. I believe that we have to have a thriving economy, but we can only do it when we change the tax structure here in New Brunswick. For too long, Liberal and Conservative governments have been caught up in this archaic, draconian tax system, which drives businesses out and refuses businesses from coming in. That's why I've been a strong proponent of changing the tax system and having comprehensive tax reform so that businesses that come can actually reinvest their money back into the province rather than giving it to government to waste in some frivolous program. I am convinced that our role in government over the last two years has had a profound impact on changing the way government thinks. For example, we have spent decades talking about the double tax. We have businesses that have advocated for years about the double tax. And for the first time, because we were there, because we were at the table, we saw a 50% reduction in the budget for the double tax. That's never been seen before. It never would have happened in a, in a majority government. Only with a minority government could that happen. COVID changed that plan, but I'm not done. We're going to keep Thank you, Mr. Austin. to remove the double tax. Lane Higgs, your response. COVID experience has taught us new way of thinking. It's taught us innovation, it's taught us working together throughout the province, but most importantly, it's taught us confidence in ourselves. And yes, we can go on with the political distribution model that has plagued our economy for years, or we, we can work with different regions about what their strengths are. And we can look at local entrepreneurs that can actually help to develop a region sustainably, where people will want to move back, and they will want to be part of that success story. And we can balance. We can balance our, our climate action with our economic development, as looking at the SMRs, which has been a project ongoing for, for many years. I agree. There's also the issue around the taxation, but uh, I would correct Mr. Austin that actually we started that back in 2012, a reduction in the taxation, the double tax program. If we look at ONB, the target is on immigration. We're looking at, can we get more people here? Can we get more private sector investment? Currently, we have an investment, investment situation where private and public sector investment are equal. We have had in the past basically a, a criteria that says, well, if I can build things I don't need, I'll create economic development. We all know there's a defined limit to that. 
I have encouraged with working with the federal government to help us to invest in things we actually need because I don't know what next year is going to look like. And that's the importance of getting value out of every tax dollar. But what we have right now through COVID is a renewed energy and renewed vibrancy. We got people looking at New Brunswick once again for the first time, moving, living and working here. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. And finally, David Kuhn. Well, thank you. I, I get so inspired every time I travel around the province meeting young people who have chosen to stay here, build a life here, and create startups, establish businesses, social enterprises, nonprofits, uh, and start farms. It, is, it gives me so much hope that those people are committed to their communities, committed to New Brunswick, and are trying to and, and working on establishing businesses and other initiatives that actually will help us fight climate change, that will help us address uh, social problems. It will provide us with products and services we need here in New Brunswick so we don't have to import them from outside so that the money can continue to circulate in our economy and create real community wealth, giving us greater food security, giving us greater energy secur security based on our own renewable, green, clean resources that do not require truckloads of money like these small nuclear power plants will require to actually get out of the computer and onto the drawing board. We've had the big nuclear reactors. That's what's driven our power rates up. Small nuclear reactors are going to take truckloads of money, and out the other end is going to come truckloads of radioactive waste, which we can't put in a truck, too dangerous, and it's going to drive our power rates up even further. So not a good approach, Mr. Higgs or Mr. Vickers. But uh, what I, I am so excited by uh, uh, what I see around the province, the issue is the disconnect between Fredericton and people out on the ground and the regions, our entrepreneurs. We need to support them with uh, the kinds of policies they need and tear down the barriers that get in their way. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Still on the theme of the economy, let's head to our panel for a question and Kevin Vickers will have the first response. Thank you, Jonna. New Brunswick cities say they can't grow and thrive without municipal tax reform. St. John needed a provincial bailout just to pay the bills. What would you do to promote the growth of New Brunswick's urban centres, Mr. Vickers? Well, I mentioned earlier that I'm going to transform the economy of the province of New Brunswick. And the question is, how are you going to do that? I'm going to do that by putting O and B on steroids we need to be out there identifying companies around the world to come here, to come to New Brunswick and investing in those three key areas that I just talked about, technology. And, you know, that technology piece is so important. We already have a great footprint in Fredericton to, to build upon. And I'm getting a team together. Steve Burns in Fredericton, a young entrepreneur, is just gung-ho to put Fredericton back on the map, and we're going to put Fredericton back on the map in cybersecurity. It has been left on the vine to wither the last couple of years, but we're going to rejuvenate and get it, get it going. And it's by growing the economy, by believing in ourselves and taking on these new issues that are so exciting and that we all want to see as go, and we're going to grow that economy, and by growing the economy, we'll have the revenues of the income to pay these challenges that the mayors are facing. And yes, tax reform is part of the, part of the issue, and I'm certainly open to sit down with the mayors of our, uh, across the province and getting input from them and listening to their concerns and building a, a strategy to move forward so that we have effective uh, tax reform here in New Brunswick. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. Uh, Chris Austin, your response. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, tax reform for municipalities is, is critical. Um, and I can tell you, we don't even really have to debate this much longer because every municipality is saying the same thing. I need people at home to understand that New Brunswick is the only province in this country where the provincial government is so heavily involved in the property tax system to the point where municipalities lay out one tax code and the province then collects those taxes and redistributes it where they so please so that municipalities are left without actually keeping the taxes that they're uh, putting on. So what we have said is that New Brunswick should get in the line with the rest of Canada, every single province, and allow municipalities to have tax classes so they can set rates accordingly. If a certain municipality finds that the residential taxes are too high, they can lower their residential taxes and increase the industrial taxes to bring in the revenue they need and chart their own course as a municipality. It's long past due to have significant municipal tax reform, and we can't do it on the backs of rural areas. We need the municipalities to be able to chart their own course and get the province out of the property tax business. No other province does it like we do here in New Brunswick. It is 
draconian, it is archaic, and it's killing the economy, it's killing our towns and cities, and that's why they simply cannot get ahead. We have pushed hard. Mr. Higgs talks about a reduction in double tax. That was crumbs that fell off the government's table until we come onto the scene to see the 50 percent reduction to get it done. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Blaine Higgs. I think we're seeing from municipalities the, the frustration. They put together a paper a few years ago, they followed that up more recently, with five priorities. And so we can decide to either be part of their solutions, which they're asking for, or we can find reasons not to participate. Their challenges are real. Uh, municipal reform is, is one of them. Municipal tax a taxation levels on industry, heavy industry, understanding that they're paying fair taxes is a must. There isn't any other way to look at it, and that study is well underway. And um, hopefully I'll be back in government, but whoever's there will see uh, the outcome of that study. The idea of, of looking at uh, tax reform across or, or regional support, I live in a community that we need to work together because we recognize the importance of the municipalities part of it. And it needs to be supported by the surrounding communities. And what that should look like, I don't know. But I think there is a newfound uh, rationale that people are saying we need to find a greater capability to work together. We need to look at our province maybe as, as different regions. We have the service commissions, 12 of them, but we have other divisions that are th throughout uh, that we can say what should a region look like? What should be in a region? What should, what is the economic generators? But we can't have this model where government will invent a job somewhere in another region that competes with a successful business in, in a particular other, another region. We have to find a way to work with municipalities to develop their region so people People say, I can live anywhere in New Brunswick. And we know that technology is a big part of that. We know that 5G is going to be a big part of our future to realize that anywhere in New Brunswick. And that's what we want people to be, anywhere in New Brunswick, to be successful. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. David Kuhn. Vibrant cities are an, an, a critical part of a successful province, and we know that. You look anywhere across Canada. Um, but apparently Mr. Higgs and Mr. Vickers don't believe in New Brunswickers to create vibrant cities. They're always looking for a white knight or a knight on a white horse to come, uh, march, uh, come riding in to save our, save our province. Our cities um, have developed a great agenda that uh, uh, we should listen to and uh, help them implement. We need... Um, regional service commissions or around the cities or metropolitan service commissions so that we can have regional service delivery focused on the metropolitan areas. Our, our main cities uh, exist within a metropolitan region, a greater Moncton, a greater Fredericton, greater St. John area, and we need to start uh, interacting with them that way. The province for too long has treated cities as dependent children. That's built right into the legislation, and we would change that to provide more autonomy to our cities, uh, to, more, to provide more authority to our cities and to ensure that they receive a greater percentage of the revenue from property taxes, which is the main source of revenue for our cities. That is absolutely essential. While we close the loopholes, there currently is, 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 has been slowing the, the revenue from property taxes from heavy industry for St. John, for example, um, which is uh, starving them for the money they should be seeing right now, and they're not. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Mackenzie Thomason, your response. When we talk about municipal tax reform, I go back to the fact that there are companies, there are corporations in this province who are not paying their fair share, who are avoiding paying what they should be paying. And in particular, when we talk about St. John specifically, Irving just built a brand new headquarters that was undervalued to the point of costing the city of St. John between 900 and a million dollars a year. They had to close one of their fire halls, and while that, not, that would not have come up with the entire amount, it would have put a significant dent into their budget shortfalls. And that's just one building. How many other buildings in the St. John area and across this province does Irving own that they're not paying their fair share on, that they're not paying their taxes on? The Irving oil refinery pays some of the lowest rates of any refinery of equal size across the entire country. When we talk about making sure New Brunswickers have the ability to access the services that they pay for, we need to make sure that we are going after corporate tax avoiders. And it's something that I have not heard yet on this stage today, and I'm sure it's probably because the Liberals and the Conservatives like the Irvings very much. But what we need to focus on is that we are going to put people first. And unless Mr. Irving is hiding in the back of this auditorium, I can guarantee you that everyone in this building today would benefit from higher corporate taxes on that company. Thank you, Mr. Thomason. All right, back to our panel for follow-up questions. A reminder, you've got up to three minutes to pose those questions, and leaders, you have a maximum of 60 seconds to respond. 
Uh, Mr. Higgs, you're, you've had two years now to flesh out some specific ideas for municipal reform to address some of these challenges, um, but I don't think we've heard too much detail during the campaign. What specifically can you put on the table for New Brunswickers to say, if re-elected, these are the things we will do? Well, I think that, um, yeah, almost two years is kind of a, an interesting concept. Uh, it seems like it was uh, cut short by maybe about seven months uh, or more. But the, the, what we have in our platform by having municipal reform and having a, an, act, an actionable uh, program by 2022, I think, was our, was our target date. Uh, we have worked closely with St. John because they were, were given, a, I guess, an um, um, uh, investment there to try to improve their situation sustainably. We've worked, uh, we've worked in municipalities. I met numerous times. We, we changed the, uh, the tourism levy as a result of a recommendation from the uh, municipalities. They have five out of four of the recommendations that we've said that we want to move forward and find solutions for. Uh, I think that we, we have said throughout this that municipal reform can come in many forms, but what I'm seeing now, and we're still on, on our goal of meeting the targets we set out, but what I'm seeing now uh, from either the, the Francophone Municipal Association or whether the Anglophone Municipal Association, we're seeing a coming together of changes needed, and that's what it's going to take to be part, inclusive, and make it happen, and I'm excited about Thank that Thank you, Mr. Prospect. Higgs. Mr. Kuhn, would you care to respond? Well, one of the things I did in the legislature was bring forward a bill to help municipalities um, acquire cheaper power, to enable them to enter into agreements with renew renewable power providers to, say, buy wind, which is the cheapest source of new electricity you possibly can acquire today, uh, and uh, simply pay a toll to MB Power for using their wires to help power their buildings and their garages and their rec centers and their community centers and so on. Uh, but Mr. Higgs's government voted that down because apparently they don't want municipalities to have lower power bills and apparently they don't want municipalities to have greener sources of energy. So that was very discouraging despite my best efforts to convince both the Minister of uh, Economic Development and Small Business and the Minister of Natural Resources and Energy that this is exactly the kind of policy support we need to put in place uh, to help our entrepreneurs in that renewable energy space to grow and flourish. Um, there was a plan for Moncton here and it fell flat because MB Power wouldn't play ball. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Mr. Vickers. Well, when we talk about municipal reform, I think one of the very core issues here is taxation and the responsible management of people's tax dollars. I've committed not to raise taxes in the next four years uh, when I become Premier. And I also am dedicated to working with the communities and the local service districts to see how we can come up with a better model going forward so everyone pays for their fair share of taxes. But taxes are important. Mr. Blaine Higgs was a finance minister of our province now for over the course of seven years, 2011 to 2014. He uh, had extensive deficits. And not only did he have those deficits, he miscalculated the deficits by over $300 million. That is why uh, we have to make sure that we have responsible fiscal management. And this myth that Mr. Higgs somehow was a great finance minister, my research shows he's among the worst. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. Final theme for the evening, values, culture, and identity. My name is Kalicia Rumba Makala, and I'm the Rural Settlement Network Coordinator for the Miramichi Region, where I work with international students and newcomer families moving to our area. Last year, we found that a record number of newcomers moved to New Brunswick, and as such, we found that we had a new challenge of finding affordable and suitable housing for these newcomers. Therefore, my question to you is, what, could you please outline what your party's target is for immigration in New Brunswick, and how is it that your government would ensure that New Brunswick is able to develop the necessary housing to accommodate a growing population, including in small centers such as the Miramichi. Chris Austin, first response to you, you have 90 seconds. Great, that's, that, that's a great question, I appreciate it. And uh, the housing issue is not just for immigrants coming to New Brunswick, the housing issue is a problem for all New Brunswickers, we hear it all the time. And, uh, you know, if we're going to be honest, I mean, these folks to my left can promise you the world that they're going to fix this in three months. But we didn't get to this housing crisis in three months. It's not going to be fixed in three or six months. It's going to take a long-term plan to get us out of this, this issue with affordable housing. And the reason why New Brunswick is in the mess it's in, again, comes back to the taxation system here in New Brunswick. 
when you, when your uh, developer puts up a, an apartment building, they are charged a double tax. They inevitably pass that double tax on to tenants, which is why most New Brunswickers pay ridiculously high rents in this province. So our plan of tax reform would include legislation to freeze rental rates for tenants so that they can see the benefit of that reduction of tax. And as, over time, as new developments come in, it gives the market more opportunity to have those homes and apartments filled. Now, in terms of immigration, uh, you know, one of the things that frustrate me the most is we have a temporary foreign worker program. We bring uh, immigrants in to work in the fields and, and to do other jobs here for a set amount of time, and then when that time's up, they go back home because they're revoked to be able to stay here. And I think that doesn't make sense. And we do that year after year after year with the same people. So what I'd like to see is some of those temporary foreign workers being able to actually be integrated into New Brunswick, become permanent citizens and, and taxpayers and a part of society here in New, at home. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Blaine Higgs. Thank you. Um, we, hitched, we increased the target uh, from 7,500 to 10,000 a year, and that needs to go even beyond that for, for new immigrants coming into our, into our province. But we also know that they need to come and they need to feel like families, and they need to be able to uh, move into our communities. And we're seeing that in, in a few of the communities. We're seeing it in Saint-Quentin with Groupe Savoie. We're seeing it in St. George with, with uh, uh, the salmon farming. We're seeing it also in, in um, Chipman and the forestry sector. So we're seeing families move into communities so they can stay there, they can work there, and they can enjoy the, the, their life right here in New Brunswick. And we do need more flexibility from the federal government in relation to having uh, families come and stay. We saw the challenge that we're having right now in, in our province. In the next eight to 10 years, we're going to have 120,000 vacancies. And we need people from everywhere in the world to be part of meeting those needs. And I'm excited when I meet people because they come here with such gratitude of having an opportunity to work and live here in New Brunswick. And also they see what beauty that many, many of us can miss, which I believe through the COVID experience, we're now recognizing. People are seeing New Brunswick again. So when I look and, and what we've been doing with the federal government, it's having more flexibility, more ability to have temporary foreign workers come in and do multiple jobs because that's another restriction that exists is that they're not able to do multiple jobs in different companies. They basically have an assigned area. So there's a lot of things that can be fixed and there's a lot of things that are being fixed right now and it was one of the main issues in the state of the province address. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. Uh, David Kuhn, your response. Well, thank you. Well. Many, many newcomers have come to my office at the constituency looking for help as newcomers and with some good suggestions about how they could be better supported uh, as, once they've arrived here or how to retain uh, newcomers in New Brunswick. What we need to do, uh, in keeping with my theme about making sure decision making is at the right level, more locally oriented, is sign a and negotiate an agreement with Ottawa as Quebec has to give us more authority over immigration so that we can actually uh, ensure we can attract the immigrants we're looking for and put in place the programs to help retain uh, immigrants in New Brunswick and integrate them into the community. Uh, for example, uh, those folks who are international students should have a direct line to permanent residency in New Brunswick and we should have the ability to help them do that uh, without having to run into the roadblocks that constantly are put in the way uh, by the central management in Ottawa. They don't even return calls to MLAs or MPs when you try and advocate for your, your uh, constituent on these issues. So we need more authority on this, we need an accord with Ottawa and we need a more robust mechanism uh, to ensure that people um, easily integrate into the community and build those all important networks. With respect to housing, we would bring in legislation that would require, ensure municipalities have the authority to require developers to create mixed housing, that is housing that has affordable units as well as more uh, um, costly units, so that there is affordable housing automatically in the mix. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Mackenzie Thomason, you have 90 seconds. It's great to hear that New Brunswick welcomed a record number of newcomers last year. It's important to point out that when we are trying to encourage people uh, from anywhere around the world, from anywhere in Canada, to stay, to come and stay in New Brunswick. We have to make sure that there are economic opportunities for them here. When we talk about why people don't want to stay, it's because the jobs they want aren't here. The pay they want isn't here. And while it's okay to say, to tell people to go to Alberta to get those wages, it's not something that is going to stimulate this economy in New Brunswick, and it's not something that is going to help our communities 
communities grow. When we are talking about people wanting to stay here, affordable housing is absolutely something that needs to be addressed. Uh, as far, my parents lived in Alberta for a very long time and they paid a much higher tax rate for their property than when they lived here. It's something that is meant to stabilize, to prevent, and to deter people from coming in, buying up a bunch of homes, and saying, okay, well, they're all going to be vacant. And it's important that we point out that when we're talking about affordable housing, when we're talking about developing affordable housing, it's the government's responsibility to work with communities, to work with uh, developers, to make sure that there are enough units in this province to not only meet the demand of people who are coming here, but to meet the demand of attracting new people. Thank you, Mr. Thomason. Kevin Vickers. I'm so lucky tonight. Another great question from the mighty Marmachi. You know, this is so exciting to grow our population and to see people like Clarissa coming to the Marmachi and enriching our community. And you know, Marmachi, I want to salute you tonight because I know the great phenomenal success you have had in attracting people from other countries to our great home on the river. Now listen, we want to really try folks to uh, build our population up, and we've set it out a goal in the platform, 100,000 people by 2030, and we're going to do that. And the way we're going to do that is by working collaboratively with the federal government. We need a premier that can work cohesively, collaboratively, and have a good, solid relationship with the government ministers at the federal level. We need more uh, uh, permits, uh, immigration permits, uh, for allowing and accommodating to bring in more uh, residences. Another important aspect of this is that provincial government has a role to play in ensuring that we have affordable housing here for our people that are here and our new arrivals. That's why in my platform, I have stated that we are going to go out and access the $300 million that has already been set aside in Ottawa uh, to work together with the federal government to build affordable housing uh, here in uh, our province to ensure that we get the homeless off the street and we have suitable housing for our new arrivals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. Now to our panel for a question on the theme of values, culture, and identity. We are seeing increasing polarization in the world, and we're also hearing calls for more inclusiveness and diversity in politics. So tell us about a time you put yourself in the shoes of someone with a different life experience than your own and how that affected your thinking. Lane Higgs, start us off with this one. Very interesting question. I think that every day that I meet someone in the province um, and discuss issues that are affecting them, it's, it's like, some, like when someone asks me, so what's it like to be premier? And I say, well, it's another job. It's a job that has a very high calling. How do I learn from what your, what your experience is to help me? When I go around and look at a business and I'm saying, how, why can't you be successful? Or why, how could you be more successful? And so, and more even recently, talking with, with business owners, and basically say, they would say, uh, well, if only we didn't, we didn't have this specification, because I can do this in Ontario or I can do this in Quebec. If I go to homeless shelters and they're saying, you know, I really would like to have a job, but I, I can't find, I don't have transportation, I don't have access. Or I have someone with mental health addiction, and they're saying that, you know, if only I could have talked to somebody before I got this far down the road. And, and so when we look at changes we need to make, it's talking with people from many, many sectors to say, what works best for you? I, I am not an inventor, but I believe I'm a listener, and I believe we need to be listen more about the challenges we face, because we will have not faced many of them, but together, we can find solutions. So when I, when I think about that, it applies in every sector all over this province. Too often, politicians have been inventors, and especially inventors at a time like this. So for me, it is listening. It is, is reacting and is being responding, and it's responding to people that need us most. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. David Kuhn. Well, this is how I have always worked as an MLA. When people come to me with a, a problem that they're looking to help solve, I try and put myself in their shoes, whether it's someone living in poverty, and I listen hard to understand the challenges they're meeting, facing eviction, um, why their power has been turned off and they can't get it turned back on, uh, what led to those situations, and then, then I try and help them resolve that, and more often than not, I can. Um, not all the time. 
because sometimes there are systemic issues that need to change, which is what I then bring to the Legislative Assembly by way of bills uh, or policy changes or, 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 or advocacy around budget items to make sure that we change the system uh, that is causing these kinds of problems. Uh, when a, a parent comes just frantic over the mental illness their children is facing and, the, and their child is facing, their inability to access mental health care, again, I try and put my, my, uh, my feet in their shoes as a parent. Uh, to, and that's not easy, that's, that's easy to do as a parent. Um, so it's all about empathy, it's about compassion, and then it's about action. And uh, that's the way I've always tried to carry myself as a member of the Legislative Assembly in my constituency work, and always on the action side, uh, if something can't be resolved uh, in that person's life and it's a systemic problem, to act to bring that forward to the Legislative Assembly and try and make change there on their behalf. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Mackenzie Thomason, your uh, response to this question. As politicians and as hopeful legislature, late legislators, it is very important that when we are talking about how to best represent our constituents, how to best represent marginalized communities, that we are listening, that we are sitting down, and that we are truly, truly listening. As a white, straight, cisgendered man, I haven't, I've been very fortunate in my life. Um, but part of what makes a good politician and part of what I strive to do on a daily basis is to sit down with people who come to me, who are asking for certain things to be done. And when I sit down with these people, I need to be able to listen. And it's something that I work on daily. It's something that I think I have become quite good at, but it is something that always requires more work. It's always something that requires more practice. And as I am meeting with people, as I am meeting with uh, those who don't look, who aren't in the same cultural ethnic group as me, I am being educated on how to be a better person, how to be a better politician, and how to hopefully be a better MLA, if that is the choice of voters on the 14th. It's about making sure that when you are thinking about how to best include your community, that you are not doing it without consultation, especially if it's a group or if it's members of your community that you yourself do not personally identify with. Thank you, Mr. Thomason. Kevin Vickers. Thank you very much for the question. You know, for 10 years, my wife Anne and I lived in First Nations communities up north actual third world conditions, no potable water, no sewer. I know exactly what our First Nations people have gone through uh, living with them and seeing the systemic discrimination and the systemic racism that exists in our society. As well, I've been up on the Canadian Peninsula during my career and see the challenges for Francophone communities and their concerns for the protection of their language rights. So I have a very, very broad experience with regards to everyone's uh, ideals with, with regards to these types of challenges. But I want to say to New Brunswickers and to Cheyenne earlier tonight, I didn't get a chance, but I'll say it here. All my life, I dedicated myself to public service. But more importantly, I dedicated myself to keeping people safe. And Cheyenne and the First Nations people of the province, the Francophone people of this province, and the many cultures of our province, and uh, Anglophone New Brunswickers as well, I want you to know that I will keep you safe that is what I do. That is who I am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. Chris Austin. You know, I have the privilege of growing up in a small town of Minto. And uh, generations ago, Minto was the economic hub of the area, believe it or not. Uh, it had the coal mines. And back then, we had all types of ethnicities and cultures that would move to Minto in the Grand Lake area to work the hard day of those coal mines. And I can tell you those folks worked hard. They worked in dangerous conditions, and uh, as hard as they worked and as dangerous as it was, they also knew how to party when they come out of the coal mines. But there was such a, a community spirit, and ethnicity and culture never created uh, the, the, the division or the tension that we see today. You see, because back then, they didn't need government to tell them how to treat people with respect. They didn't need government to enact all these different types of policies to ensure that community was just that, community. And I'm proud of my community, and even today, if you come to Minto, you'll see there's all kinds of ethnicities there. There's, there's families from Dutch families, Italian, Acadian, uh, German. All those have stayed and remained in that community and have kids of their own, and it has uh, continued to flourish in terms of the diversity. And they were multicultural before multiculturalism was even a sexy term. 
And I think at this day and age, we have to simply learn to treat people, judge them on their actions, not on their skin color, not on their language, not on their ethnicity. We as New Brunswickers are better than that. I believe we're better than that. And we have to let our true compassion and understanding shine through when we relate with one another. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Now over to our panel. You have three minutes to pose a follow-up question to one or more of the leaders. And leaders, a reminder, you have a maximum of 60 seconds to respond. Okay, thank you, Jonah. Mr. Higgs, this is for you. It has come to light that your candidate in Victoria Lavallee, Roland Michaud, uh, posted a car cartoon about knocking out the teeth of a transgender person. Uh, your candidate in Rustigouche West, Louis Berroubet, called transgender people disturbed. Can you please clarify your response to each and explain any difference? Well, certainly my response uh, to our candidate um, um, in the Grand Falls area was certainly very, uh, very direct, very prompt. Uh, um, it, there was no debate there about the inacceptability of the, uh, of the posts that I had seen that were liked or shared. So I don't think there's any confusion about the reaction that, that um, would no longer see him as a, uh, as a PC candidate. The, um, the, other, uh, the other situation was one that uh, certainly was um, later in time, it was back in 2016, the, the um, candidate had um, expressed remorse. It, it was a, a personal opinion. I don't condone it in any way, shape or form. Um, that particular candidate went through a vetting, a vetting process, not only, um, not only in our party, but with the Green Party as well, ran as a Green candidate in the last federal election. Uh, but we vetted him as well. Um, the conditions were uh, different in relation to uh, the timing, but in the personal belief, and, and we Thank felt you, like- Thank you, Mr. Higgs. It was Chris Austin, would you like to uh, jump in on this? Well, look, um, there's no question those remarks that, that we saw in the, in the media was, was uh, unacceptable. And I think any party leader up here would say the same. Um, you know, when you talk about social media, it is indeed a, uh, it, it can have very positive effects on society, it can have very negative effects on society, and I don't know how many people I've talked to uh, that have gone through the, you know, the area where you've put something on Facebook that you deeply regret the next day, and we have to be more careful about what we put on Facebook or in, in Twitter and other social media venues, there's no question of that, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think what troubled me was the fact that you know, and, and I commended Mr. Higgs as a leader of the PC party for removing that candidate, but yet you had another candidate come out that said something just as egregious or worse, and yet they remain. So you can have it both ways. You're either going to look at these issues and deal with them, uh, or, you know, let them stay just in hopes to win the seat. Uh, but at the end of the day, social media is a beast, and uh, it does have a negative effects in, in many avenues. Thank you, Mr. Austin. And Mr. Vickers, I'd like to hear your response to this question. Yes. No, these are obviously very troubling, troubling times. But, you know, I believe what this all comes down to is the core values of our society. And my dad, Bill Vickers, up the Miramichi, always taught me the importance of respecting the dignity of people. And I believe that's a cornerstone of our society here in New Brunswick and coming together. But when these types of utterances are made, there cannot be any, any uh, acceptance of them or any uh, uh, procrastination in dealing with them uh, directly. I do compliment uh, Mr. Higgs for his quick actions with regards to his candidate up in uh, Grand Falls, but it troubles me that the individual uh, up in the Kedgwick area, uh, Restigouche West, uh, remains for those comments. We have a transgender person running in our riding of Harbour uh, St. John, Alice McKim, an incredible high school teacher who's shown incredible passion for the Harbour community, Ward 2 down in St. John, and it's people like that coming forward that'll make us successful. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. Well, that concludes the question and answer portion of our forum. But just before we leave you, let's get our closing statements from each of the leaders. Uh, gentlemen, you will have one minute and 15 seconds each for your closing uh, statements. Let's begin with Mackenzie Thomason. We've heard today different visions for New Brunswick. We have heard today different ideas of how we should be performing as a province. One thing I have not heard from either of the two large parties is what they plan to do for the people of New Brunswick in regards to making sure that they have access to their services.
Minority governments work. It has been shown over the last two years that when you can keep the big party's feet to the fire, things can get done and things can move forward. We are the party of labor in the NDP. The egregious treatment of labor unions by both the liberals and the conservatives must stop. Electing more third-party MLAs, electing fewer large-party MLAs is going to move this province forward. It is going to prevent parties from inflicting damage on New Brunswickers by only considering their own party's wishes. I want to thank everyone here today for having me, and don't forget to vote on September 14th for the party with heart. Vote NDP. Thank you, Mr. Thomason. And David Kuhn, your closing statement. Thank you. As Greens, we offer a, a clear choice, a choice to elect candidates with fresh new ideas and energy who will work for you. We have the most diverse slate of candidates of any of the parties, and in the Legislative Assembly, our caucus will look like New Brunswick. It will look like you. I'm so inspired by the creative, energetic people I meet in every corner of our province who are so committed to their communities and to New Brunswick. It really gives me hope. And it gives me hope that so many people now are just fed up, fed up with political games and are done with that. We can't accept the bare minimum anymore. We need real leadership at this moment in our history. The choice is clear. Vote for your local Green candidate. And in doing so, you're supporting me as well. I will always put you at the heart of every decision our government makes. On Monday, vote Green. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Blaine Higgs, your closing statement, please. As Premier, I see myself as a facilitator, not an inventor. A seeker of solutions by listening and collaborating with citizens and employees across this province. I have always put province before politics. I want results for every tax dollar spent because it is, after all, your money. I want our province to move beyond COVID I want us to be stronger and better in everything we do. I want to ensure the stability, the continuity, and strong leadership throughout this pandemic and into the future. We have a solid plan, and our entire province is rising together. Momentum is building throughout our province like never before, and people are looking at New Brunswick and saying, what is happening in New Brunswick? People want to return home. People want to invest. They want to build houses. I'm excited about what I'm seeing all over this province. We want stability. We want to move forward in a way like we've never moved before in our province because now we believe in our province. We can be number one. This time, a majority PC government will be different because I am different. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. Kevin Vickers, your closing statement. Thank you for joining us this evening. Blaine Higgs called an unnecessary election in the middle of a pandemic because he wants the full authority to implement policies like closing our rural hospitals. He wants you to believe his plan has gone away, but it hasn't. He is trying to balance the books on the backs of our most vulnerable. Blaine Higgs wants you to think that he will listen to you, but under Blaine Higgs, there's only one way, his way. He's more interested in clinging to power than in growing the economy or in your health and safety. Working together, our Liberal team will transform our economy to bring good jobs to all regions of our province. We will address climate change and grow the green economy. We'll work with parents and teachers to better educate our children, and we'll make health care a key priority for all New Brunswickers. To help make all these things happen, I'm asking you to support your Liberal candidate, and then we can bring back hope and opportunity for all New Brunswickers. Thank you, and good night. Thank you, Mr. Vickers, and to Chris Austin now. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to give you some carefully calculated script that was written by some political hack in the back room. I'm going to give it to you directly. At the end of the day, this election really is about whether we go back to majority governments that have ruled this province for 100 years that got us in the position we're in, or do we carry forward with the historical election we've seen that you and I together broke the majority governments to create a minority situation which provided stability and accountability. That's the question. Do we go back to majorities? Do we carry forward with minorities, with governments that work, with governments that can be held accountable, with a government that does not have one party calling all the shots? 
That's what this boils down to, ladies and gentlemen. You know it, and I know it. And these folks to my left, the red and, and the blue, can tell you that they need stability, and they need this, and they need that. Stability was only broken when the PC caucus fell apart. That's when stability was broken. We provided that stability for a year and a half. We provided accountability to ensure the bad decisions were not carried forward. We must continue a minority government. The People's Alliance is the only party to do it. Vote People's Alliance. Thank you very much, Mr. Austin. Well, that is all the time we have. Uh, we'd like to thank all of you for participating in tonight's forum. Be sure to tune in to CBC New Brunswick special election night broadcast on Monday, September the 14th. Thank you for joining us. Good night.